Yeah. Okay, the Maimah that we learned from, from the Rebbe Marash actually continues, even though it looked like it ended. In the way that it's printed, it was separated into two Maimahim, but it was said as one Maimah. And I guess it was published, put out there as two Maimahim, and split into two. So we're going to continue um, and, and see how the continuation of the Maimah goes. The, ma- the paragraph on the bottom of page Reish Yud Zayin, the very bottom, where it says, like, like, a, like a new mimer, this paragraph was added. It wasn't said when the mimer was said. It was added in order to make it look like the beginning of a new mimer. Uh, and we'll see, it's quite repetitive because the paragraph here of questions actually come later in the mimer itself. So it was just in order to present it, not in the middle of an, an Indian, but starting off with questions... Um, and like a Hemshah continuation, uh, it was printed that way. And interestingly, the Rebbe Narash was the first of the Rebbein to do Hemshechim, continuing Mamarim, series of Mamarim. Long ones. He did very long ones as well. It would and be like one week after, like how? Yes, yeah, so he'd say a Mamar on, on one day, and then the next week or the next year or whatever would continue, and sometimes it would continue for weeks and weeks, mm-hmm. um, years sometimes as well. Wow. And uh, that's something the Rebbe Shab certainly continued with Big Hem Sheikh and continued, continued Mamarim. Uh, the Friedrich Rebbe also did. And even the Rebbe, there are certain Mamarim that are Hem Sheikh uh, over a period of a couple of weeks or a few weeks. So the Rebbe Marash was the first to do that, which the Rebbe explained because he was Lechatchila Rebbe. So Chassidus also was over the top. So th- but this Mamar is actually one Mamar said on the same Shavuos, Tafresh Chavtes. But we'll, we'll learn how it was made into a second mimer. The, the last two lines on the page, Rishi Zayin. We know that in the Torah it says that the people saw the voices. At Matan Torah, how Sinai, they saw the voices. Our sages explain, that the people had a super sensory experience where they saw what is usually heard and heard what is usually seen. So the sight of, the, the power of sight was used to capture sound, the power of hearing to, to capture vision. So I love it. We have to understand this. Hello, Beseres Adibris, Nemru Dvarim Pshutim. In the Seres Adibris, what Hashem said in the Seres Adibris were pretty straightforward things. Kamoi, like, next page. Lo Sirtzach, Lo Sinnaf, Lo Sigma, Lo Sana. It says, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't be a bear false witness. This is sort of basic morality. 101. It's not major revelation here. <laughs> so why did there need to be thunder and lightning and a major sound and light show along with Don't Steal? But in Mitzrayim, where they just come from, all these things were normal. Like, Could be, because so. Mitzrayim was Erev Sa'aretz, was a lowly, immoral land. Okay, the fact they might need to be told and reminded, you know, you really shouldn't steal and murder. Okay, that's fair enough. But is it such a fanfare? Is it such a major event that there has to be thunder and lightning and uh, this huge impact on the world to tell us you shouldn't murder? That's basic morality that many other nations have figured out without any major revelation. So it just seems odd that the whole Mount Terror experience came along with this dramatic explosion of strange weather and um, <laughs> as, as if something cataclysmic is about to be revealed. The secrets of the universe are about to be told. God is now coming down to tell you don't murder. Bit of an anti We have to understand, we have to understand, apart from the thunder and lightning, that Hashem himself came down on the mountain to tell you such simple things. You need God to tell you not to steal? You'd be disappointed. So to understand this, to understand why it needed to be such a major event to tell us such simple things, we have to understand first what we discussed earlier in the Maimon. That it says that Hashem spoke to us face to face. Which we explain means 
that Hashem, through the Aserus Adibris, inserted the Shem Havaya, Yud Kevavkei, within every one of us. That's Ponim, the Ponim, Dibur Havaya. That face to face Hashem, Havaya spoke. Ha- Hashem put Hashem in us through the Aserus Adibris. And we explained that for the body to also be a receptacle for the soul, which has Yud Kevavke in it, the body itself has to be in the shape of Yud Kevavke, which means that the body is not a resistance to Yud Kevavke, it's not a contradiction to Yud Kevavke, it itself can house Yud Kevavke. The, the divine light that rests in the soul can actually rest in our body as well. And this all happened at Matan We have to go into this deeper to understand what that means, and then we'll understand the entire event of Matan much better. So look at the next paragraph. Yuvan Bir Dovazeh. We'll understand the explanation of this. Mimashin Noida, Minyin Hagilgulin. By examining uh, an idea that is known re- in reference to Gilgulin, to reincarnation. Shemis Galgul Nefesh Adnan Bebehema. That we know it's possible that a human soul can be reincarnated in the form of an animal. That Just after. One page is enough. After, after living a life as a human being, in a human body, a soul can come back down in this world in the form of an animal. So you were a person in one lifetime, and in the next lifetime you're a possum. Or <laughs> a cow, or a dog, or a cockroach. Depends for who. Um, but look, but for, first the human. It's not, cockroaches aren't reincarnated as people. A person might be reincarnated as a cockroach and then come back as a person. Okay. That could happen. That so, like but it's not like it's not like a cockroach doesn't fulfill its mission, so it comes back as a person uh, for punishment. That that doesn't happen. <laughs> but, <laughs> but a person could come back as a as a non-human and then maybe come back as a human later again. So so. So says the the Rebbe Rosh. On the second line of the second paragraph from Reish Yud Ches, Shatzar, the second word, Shatzar mezegod ma'ot. The pain of a human soul being in an animal body is huge. Just that, not 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 the, the cockroach being squashed, or or the suffering of an animal. Just a human soul being crammed into an animal body is already painful. It's like wearing a, a shoe that's like. Five sizes too small for you. It's painful. It hurts. You're, you're, cr- you're squashing the, a human soul with all the talents and all its abilities and all its potential into an animal's body, which is so limited, so not able to express what it is. That itself is extremely painful. So after going through that, a soul can then come back into a human. That's not enough to rectify it. Sometimes it might be enough, but but sometimes not. Sometimes the whole point is to learn what it's like. Mm-hmm to be in a body that can't fulfill the soul's potential. So, next time, don't waste your time and fulfill your potential in, in human form. Yeah, so, yeah. Some animals live a very short time and some animals live a very long time. Yeah. So, does that make a difference? Like, when the soul is put into a long living or a short living or a long could reason? Be. Yeah, but it could, could, be there, could, could be there short term. You don't have to be there the whole life. The cockroach's entire life might not have the human soul in it. it might just be for a certain amount of time and it can move on. Mm-hmm. I remember reading about the Arizal who was able to sort of release neshamas that were trapped in walls and stones and things mm-hmm. like that. So they were also in inanimate objects Correct. and not just animals. Yeah. Plants and rocks and water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's even worse. So, so the Rebbe Raj asks, so one second, does this make sense that it's painful for a human soul to be in an animal's body? The soul is a spiritual entity. The Einbos which can't be divided up into parts. The commercial cost is a as is explained elsewhere. Even the spiritual powers of the soul 
can't be divided up and identified within the soul itself. Like to say that in the soul itself, the power of Chachma is in this part of the soul, and the power of Bina is over there in that part of the soul. A soul is not a divisible thing. So what the Roman Rashi is asking is, why would it be painful for a human soul to be in an animal body? If the soul was a physical thing, so in physical things, something big can't fit into something small. But a spiritual thing doesn't have big or small, doesn't have shape. So what would it matter if a human soul is in, a, is in an animal's body? Why would that affect the soul? It's not that the soul has in it Chachma over here, Bina over there, all these potentials and powers, and then when you put it into a, an animal's body, it's like squashed up all its powers. A soul is just a, a, a unit, a spiritual entity that is indivisible and can't be uh, compartmentalized. So when that soul goes into a human body, it fits. If it goes into an animal's body, so it fits there. Like, why, why should it be any different? To say it matches, if you say that a human soul fits a human body, but uh, it doesn't fit an animal's body, that only makes sense if the soul has shape, if, if the soul, soul has bits and pieces. So you say, well, the soul has the power of wisdom, the power of speech, the power of intellect, the power of walking, and all these powers fit into a human body because the human body has the intellect and the feet and everything to, for a human movement. That's, that only makes sense if the soul has a shape. But the soul doesn't have a shape. It has in it all these powers in potential, but they're not actually there that you can identify and point to. So therefore, when that soul goes into an animal body, so it's fine. But what could it do? The whole thing is that it should do something with the body. What can it do with an animal? It could do a mitzvah. What could it do? What's the point of it? It's like it's really, it, it can't do, it can't express itself. <laughs> to not express itself means that there's something to express. That the soul has got all these powers that need to be expressed. And in a human body they can be expressed, in an animal body they can't be expressed. But that itself is what the Reb is asking. Who says it's got anything to express? A soul is just a soul. When it's in a human body, it takes human shape. And when it's not, it doesn't. It doesn't seem to make sense for a human soul to be in an animal body. It sounds like it should be painful. It doesn't have the right... Okay, why? Like uh, w- why? Because we're assuming that the human soul has in it all these realities that need to be expressed and can only be expressed in a human body. But it doesn't. The, hu- the human soul is just a spiritual energy. And it will fit whatever shape it's put into. Because it's undefined. But then it shouldn't but be painful to be it's not a human hand. soul. Human soul means it has a definition and it's a human soul. If it's just <coughs> a spiritual energy, but it's it's a human soul energy. Yeah, you have an animal soul, a human soul, a Jewish soul. This, it's different. But right. different. If uh, you have a PowerPoint on the wall, and into that PowerPoint you could plug a huge machine or you could plug your mobile phone on silent. And <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what would, does it make a difference to the plug? Is, it, would you say, this plug could, could power a huge machine, and, and now you just put your little phone in there? You know, this plug has the power, does have the power to, to energize a big machine. And a little one too. So are you saying there's no difference between an animal soul and a human soul? No. A human soul can energize a human. And, a, and, a, and, a, and, and it encompasses an animal as well. So if you put an animal what's soul it, what's it into missing? a human, it wouldn't work? Because it doesn't no. fit in the shape. No, because the animal soul doesn't have what a human needs. Jewish people That's are like the voltage is not enough. Like, like that, like a good table of pencil. That soul really power. can't fit into the animal. Body. Yeah, it, I don't know. I'm not understanding this indivisible point. Because, because to me, I don't understand the question. Like Let's keep learning and become clear.
<laughs> let the Rambam Ashkenaz explain it much better than I. Oh, this is a punishment for the Neshama. Yeah, it's a punishment. So I'm not trying to understand why. Why? Why, why is it painful? Why, why? Yeah. When you say painful, you don't really mean a physical painful. What's well, a soul? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let, let's let's keep reading and it'll become clearer. So you can't say that that in the soul there's koicha chachma over here and koicha bina over there. Or valderes at the end of the fourth line. Valderes there koicha midus. So too with emotions, that there's chesed, there's love in the soul in this part, and and there's judgment in that. No, it doesn't work that way. Or koicha zegashmim, or in the physical senses that are sourced in the soul, k'mayriyo shmiya like sight and sound, hearing and, 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 and seeing. When the soul enclosed in a body, so then these various faculties divide up and become separate entities. But that's only when the soul is within the body and the faculties each go to their particular limb. But in the soul itself, they're all one. You cannot divide between them. So, meaning, if you look at the human soul before it comes into the body, what do you see? Just soul. Then when that soul encloses in a body, suddenly from that soul is drawn out the power of sight, the power of hearing, the power of thinking, the power of walking, as separate entities. The power of sight is in the eyes, not in the ears. But that's only once the soul's in the body, then it, each part goes to its position. But before that, they're not parts. There's just soul. So if that soul is plugged into a human body, so then the, the human power of, of intellect is revealed, the human power of walking, the human power of seeing and hearing come out. And all these faculties, much more than an animal has, comes out of that soul. But if that same soul goes into, a, uh, into an animal's body, so, whatever the animal body can handle is what it will get. Where's the pain? If you would say that in the soul itself there is the power of, of thinking like a human, and a human being needs intellectual stimulation, and so the soul is waiting for this intellectual stimulation, once it goes into a body, so then it starts working in the brain. Then, I can understand that if that same soul would go into an animal, it would be frustrated. I I, I, there's no stimulation here. What a boring life. But the soul doesn't have that power as a differentiated power until it goes into the body. Only when the soul is in the body that it starts to have this intellectual power revealed. Till then, it wasn't there. It was just a soul. So if that soul ends up in, a, in an animal body, so what's it, what's it missing? What is it missing? Where's the frustration? Where's the pain there? If you put a uh, um, and the shama into a, a person who has limited ability, like someone with Down syndrome or something like that. They're also restricted. They also can't express themselves or use all of their capabilities to their fullest. So is the soul in pain? Well, I don't know, but wouldn't that be preferable for the shama to... Well, I mean, what I'm saying is, wouldn't it be... It also seems like some kind of punishment mm-hmm. on some level to be in a, a body like that. So for the soul? For the soul. Yeah, for the soul. No. Because it, it can't fully express itself. I saw yesterday a video where the Rebbe Dollars told somebody whose son is autistic that you should know that the fact that your son doesn't interact with other people means that he's freer to connect with Hashem. He's supposed to be special. The Rebbe called them special people, not so, handicapped or So what you see as a limitation from the outside for his neshama is not a limitation at all okay. so doesn't that apply with an animal as well no? yeah you would think like, so, so the fact that the soul's not stuck in the body was well, it's a problem for the soul the soul's going to miss something I just don't think you're <laughs> hmm. so the l'chein in the number of the paper l'chein but matin terek see the chola amre masakolis that's why at Matan Torah it says that the people saw the voices. Rom Razal, Roim es Nishma, B'Shem es Nira, and we just quoted the Chazal that they saw what is usually heard and heard what is usually seen. Just give the brackets. V'Hainu Mipnei Shki Al Kol Dibur Parchan Nishmasan. 
how are they able to see what's heard and see uh, and and hear what's seen? Because when Hashem spoke, their soul left them. Al Kol Dibur. When Hashem spoke, the Sefer Dibrus, it says Parch Nishmas, and their souls left their bodies. Meaning, Pirush She Parch Mislabish Lahar Beguf Bekoiches Pratim Hamovdolim Zemazet. Meaning, their soul left the body, meaning was no longer enclosed within the body where each faculty has its particular place and it does what it does. Rather, the soul went back into its source where there is no division on that level between the various faculties. Therefore, they were able to see what is heard and hear what is seen. Because in the soul... The power of sight is not so differentiated yet that it can only see. And the power of hearing is not so differentiated that it can only hear. They went to a supersensory level, higher than the senses, where each faculty is not yet defined. So therefore, seeing and hearing, you could see with your, your, your hearing power, and you can hear with your seeing power. It's all one thing. So they saw that when they were in the state that the neshama wasn't in a body? Yeah, that's what oh, it means. Wow. So, oh, when, so, when so, it was parcha. Yeah. yeah, so the Rebbe Re- Re- is, is connecting these two mamari chazal. And so, yeah. There's one mamari chazal that says they saw what is heard and heard what is seen. Another one says, parcha neshama, when Hashem spoke to them, their soul left them. Which we usually understand as being they died out of yeah, shock. Yeah. What it means is their soul went so, up uh, to a level above their body where therefore their various faculties and powers are not limited to the body's definition of those powers. So they could hear what's seen and seen, which is hers, which, which is heard. So were they alive? Then they were. If a soul like is a out of your body, are you alive? Yeah. Not really. Huh? No, no. 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 they were the oh, body. So and then they were, and then they were revived. Yeah. But it's not the Rebbe says that, that uh, Shavuos is the yard site of the <laughs> authors of, Chit- of Chit- Chitas. Mm-hmm. Chumash written by Moshe Rabbeinu, yeah. Tilim written by David Amalek, and Tanya, the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, written by the Altar, but the teachings of Baal Shem Tov. <laughs> so all three died on Shavuos. What, Moshe died? Moshe died on Shavuos. Adam, Zion, Adam. So do we think he died on Zion, Adam, right? Yeah. So what the Rebbe forgot that. <laughs> so the Rebbe explains no, that no, Parach par- par- Hanishma son. That the when Hashem spoke, uh-huh. their souls left them. So Moshe Rabbeinu mm-hmm. also. His Neshama also left his, his body? Also? Apparently. Really? Parach Hanishma son. Okay. Wow. Yeah, my son, because I thought he was a human as well. Yeah, but then he spoke afterwards. Hmm. I know, but everybody else was, yeah. the no, Neshama was in the body. Why should he miss out on that experience? <laughs> <laughs> why should he miss out? So, the next paragraph. Amma, don't talk about it. So, we have to understand this deeper. Hala nizbo le'el b'mashal shum yizkoich ha'riya hukoich dak v'ruch ni'yosa, l'chen b'hefra shizlabish b'dava gashmi yosa. Hainol litvaz dava gashmi. We explained earlier in this minor that because the power of sight is a deeper faculty within the soul, therefore it lands on a further entity, which is an external physical thing. You can only see something that is physical. Why? Because it's so deep and high in the soul, the deeper something is, the, the higher it is, the further it reaches. So therefore, where does sight land? Where does sight capture itself? In something that is physical and external. Because the higher something is, the further away it will be revealed. Like we said in other marshal, that when you have an, an engravement, a graving of words on a shiny surface, so then it's harder to read those words as opposed to but if, if, it's, uh, if the same words were engraved on a less shiny uh, surface, like metal, you could see it. But when it's on a, a shiny stone, you can't see it. Third last line. 
כי סיבס מה שיהיה אפשר לקרוא סום זה או בהירוס האבן הטוב. So we said that the reason why you can't read the words on a shiny diamond is the shininess of the diamond. If it would be on a stone that is not shiny, it would be easy to read. Top of the next page. But if you then stamp from the shiny stone onto wax, an external thing, now you can read the words that are engraved on the stone. So because it's shiny, you can't read on it, but further away from it, you can, you can, you can. So the rule is, the higher something is, the further away you need to go in order to experience it. So now, based on that knowledge which we have previously in the moment, that the power of sight is higher, therefore it can only detect something that's far away from it, that's where it's experienced, so now, how's it possible to say that they saw what was heard? Romus and Nishma. What, did, what would that, that would indicate a belittling of the power of sight to, to see something that's usually heard is a lowering of the power of sight, not, not a, a, a heightening of it. Because we said, because the power of sight is so deep and high, therefore it can only see something that's physical which is far away from it. Now we're saying that in Torah we saw what's heard. Mm. What is that doing to the power of sight? It's, it's lowering it to, to... Because the fact that you can hear things that are heard is because hearing is not as high as seeing. Mm. So now you're seeing things that are heard. How, how can that work? So you're, lowering one and you're lowering the power of sight. And elevating mm. the hear. Mm. That the power of sight in the soul is even higher. It's like a ray of the sun within the sun, where some, where you don't notice the ray of the sun. So too, something that is heard should not be noticed by sight, because sight is so high. Shosham mm-hmm. Hu says, Rakshu Bhattal al That, of course, there's rays of the sun in the sun, but they're lost because the sun is there. So too, there's sound within sight, but it's lost because sight is higher. Like we said with the stone, when you engrave on a stone, there is a bit of shade there when you engrave. There is a bit of darkness in an engravement. The smoothness of the stone has been affected. But the stone is still so bright that you can't see the words written on it. So what about before you've engraved on the stone? Can you see the words on the stone before you've engraved? Of course not. Even when they're engraved, it's hard to see. Before you've engraved anything, there's nothing to see. So in the power of sight, as it is above the soul, how much higher then is the power of sight than when it is in the soul? And so now everything's upside down. Doesn't make sense. If the power of sight, as it is in, in, as it is within our body down here, can only see something far away physical, so imagine the power of sight as it's left the body and gone back up into the soul. It's even higher then, and we could see what was heard. It doesn't make sense. That when the when the power of sight is in a higher state, now you now you can hear something, you can see something that's heard. It doesn't make any sense. It's like saying that when the letters are engraved on the stone, you can't read them, but before they're engraved, you can read them. <laughs> Makes no sense. So we need to explain why was this the out of body experience of Matan Torah, where the soul left the body. And therefore, the powers, the faculties of the soul were not limited and defined. So therefore, they're in a higher state. How come that enabled us to see which, that which is heard, which seems to be a lower state? So there's really another type of hearing, which is even higher. <laughs> and another level of soul. Maybe. V'yesh lemar al-zagimotarism. Look at the next paragraph. Very interesting. The Remarash says there are three 
answers we could say to this. Three explanations to what it means that we could see that which is heard and why that's a, an elevation, a step up. How is it possible? What are the three explanations? Ha'alf. The first one is this. Sharehem loy ro'u ko gashmi kim ko l'shalakosh barufu sha'omasayos adibrus what they saw was not a physical voice. It was Hashem's voice. Hashem saying the Esos of Ibris. Ayakolish, Ayabes, Matan Torah. All the sounds that accompanied Matan Torah. Spiritual sounds. They can't be compared to normal sounds. What type of sound did we say cannot be seen by sight? Physical sound, sound in this world. Why? Because it's higher, it's more subtle than a physical object, and sight can only see something physical. Okay, that, that rule applies to physical sound, sound in this world. But the sound that they saw then was the sound of Hashem's voice, or the divine noises of Matan Torah. So it, it's a different rule, it's a different system, you're not, you're not talking about the same thing. So the fact that they saw that which, which, is, which is heard is not a belittling of the, of the power of sight when that which is heard is Hashem's voice. Mm-hmm. So therefore, the fact that the soul was in a higher state and, the, and, the, and then in that highest state it saw that which is heard makes perfect sense because what was heard? Hashem's voice. It doesn't mean when they saw that which is heard they heard what the person next to them was saying they, they saw the voice. That's what he's talking about. It's not that, that they saw the birds chirping. It's they saw Hashem's voice. That is a higher type of seeing. That, 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 that's okay. <laughs> In fact, they couldn't hear anything else. Everything went quiet. So. Right. right. And there was also no echo, which means it's not a physical kind of right. sound reverberation. Correct. Correct. So, so we're talking about a totally different type of sound. And therefore, our question is dealt with. It's not, it's not a problem in the first place. If we're saying that they were in such a high state that they could see voices, like other people's voices, then we'd have a question. What do you mean, see other people's voices? That's not a, that's not a heightening of sight. That's a lowering of sight. But to see Hashem's voice and divine noises, okay, fine. So that, that is a heightened level. That, that, that makes sense. Good answer. We, we, we prove. <laughs> Third line, Lloyd <laughs> Yeshleimer. Po- another possible explanation. The third line there. Lloyd Yeshleimer. Shemet nei shebet nafshe adayin einam chalukim kol kach, memela adayin einam nikrit goidol meilas koi chariya al koi hashmiya. Another way you could say is like this. Because we're talking about the soul has gone back into its self, not in the body, but beyond the body. So when the soul is at that level where the various faculties are not yet divided up and differentiated, so therefore the advantage of the power of sight over the power of hearing is actually not all that expressed. When the soul is in the body and the various faculties are in their place, sight in the eyes and hearing in the ears, then you can see and identify the difference between them and the advantage of one over the other to the point where you can't compare something you saw to something you heard about. But when those faculties are not in the body, but they're in the soul, and they're yet to have differentiated and divided up, then you can't say that the power of sight is higher than the power of hearing, because they're not differentiated. So is that always... There's no differentiation. Yeah. It's, it's explained elsewhere in, in, in the, the idea that at creation there was what's called Maim El the waters on high and the waters below. That Hashem divided up two different waters. There's waters that are down here in this world, and there's waters that are divided and placed up in the heavens. Before they were divided up, the difference between them was not really clear, between these two waters. They were all just one thing. And by dividing them, they became two very 
totally different entities. There's water down here, which is physical water, and there's water up there, which is a totally different type of water, which we don't even know what it is. Before, they were one thing. But once they were divided, they became two very different things. So too, the power of sight and the power of hearing are very different things once they've been divided. And once they've been divided, the power of seeing has its faculties and its characteristics and the power of hearing different. But before they divide it up, it's not so easy to differentiate between them. So then why does it have to mention it? What? That they saw what was heard and heard what was saw. To show that they were having a super sensory... If it would but be just, just normal, that, they, just they saw what was seen and heard what was heard, so nothing's happened. Yeah, but no. if we know that their Nishanas departed, yeah. so it seems like then everything becomes equal. That's what it's saying. So you could see what's hear, heard and hear what's seen. And there's other significance as to why, what, why seeing the things that are heard is a good thing to do. and you know, that, that's, a, that's a different explanation what that means. The, the significance like, of it did is... Did we explain that already before? Like, by saying that the two things were really one, this is the same thing. I don't see what's being added oh, okay. with the second explanation. No, because, because we're saying that they saw what's heard. We're not saying that they, that they saw and heard everything. We're saying that they saw what is heard and heard what is seen. So the two faculties exist but they exist on a level where the, the def defining features of seeing and hearing are not yet expressed and therefore and therefore seeing that which is heard is not an insult to seeing it's a it's a higher experience we will explain that point they're doing a different function yeah. as to being in the body yeah, yeah. So uh, it just seems on this level you can't even use the words hearing and seeing because it's all indivisible. Like it's the wrong terminology. I don't know. No, you can because the soul, even outside of the body has the power of seeing things and hearing things. It does. Just those faculties are not so differentiated as they are in the body, so therefore the rules that govern them are not the same. Like, like in a dream, do you see things or hear things? Did the person actually say that, or you just saw the, the words? It's very, it's very blurry in, in a dream state. But they're seeing and hearing. They're just blurred. Valderz a yuvan, in the middle paragraph. Valderz a yuvan be koiches and nefesh. Shikesh ehem mislab shim be guf, oz be emes nas avdolo ben koiche riel koiche shmir. Only when the powers are in the body is the division between sight and sound, between the two powers of hearing and, and seeing, clear. But when they're still included in the soul, there's still power of sight and power of, of hearing, they're two so powers, but they're not so divided. So therefore, the power of sight in its source is not higher than the power of hearing. So therefore, the power of sight could be used for sound, and that is not a belittling of the power of, of sight, because in its source, it's not necessarily so much higher than hearing. The, um, the hierarchy is not there at that stage. Right, so what we said about that seeing can only see something physical because it's so high, so it can only be captured in something so far away. That's talking about as it's expressed, but in its source, it's not so high compared to hearing. They're all from the same source, so therefore it can see that which is heard when you're in that state. That's the second answer. A third answer, a third explanation. We are on seven lines from the bottom of the page. The middle line. 
ועוד יש להם, שזה לא כמו שכוסר הם של הפחד עמוי, אוי זה שאול במרי נוף. It's like it says that Hashem has all the power and all the awe, and He makes peace in the higher realms. What does this mean? מכל שעה של מים, וגברי או שעה של אש. In the angelic world, you have the angel Michael, who is in charge of water, which is chesed and love. Then you have the angel Gavriel, who is in power of fire, which is gvura and harshness. And they coexist in the heavens, and they don't extinguish each other. Normally, if you put water and fire together, one of them is going to go. Either the water is going to put out the fire, or the fire is going to evaporate the water. They can't coexist. In the heavens, Michal and Gavriel are partners. They work together. <coughs> one's fire, one's water, and they don't extinguish each other. Why? Because Hashem is above them. And therefore, each one is bottled to him. And so therefore, instead of asserting himself, uh, each one just does what it needs to do without getting in the way. They, they're, they're bottled to a higher thing. So therefore, they can coexist. Meaning, behind it. In a government, you could have two ministers who hate each other. They're arch enemies and they can't stand each other. They're totally opposite characters. And their job is different. One of them, their, his job is to expand the empire. The other one is the treasurer who has to make sure that the money is, is used carefully. So one of them wants to spend and spend, and the other one wants to hold back. So they might not hate each other personally. It might be just their job is totally opposite. And so each one is contradicting the other. But those two ministers, when they're in front of a king, but when they're in front of the king, they become best friends. And they'll talk to each other, and they'll get on with each other and discuss. Because in front of the king, your personal issues and your particular job is not relevant. You have to be a part of the big picture, which is the king. So therefore, two enemies can talk like best friends because the king overrides both of them. In fact, when they're in front of the king, they so don't have any self apart from their job that if the king told this one to do that one's job, they could do it. And they would have to do it. And they would be able to. Even though it's totally not his thing. But if the king told him, you have to do the other guy's job, he could do it. And it can happen sometimes that the other one, you have to do his job. He's, he's, he's not well today, so you have to do what he does. If the king says, you do it. So you can go to your very opposite because the king, you're to- so bottled to the king that whatever he says goes. A similar thing happened here. When the Eden heard the Aserah Sedibris and on each word that Hashem said, their soul left their body, because of such an awesome revelation, each particular faculty of the soul lost itself entirely, completely lost its identity, and went into its source. So therefore, sight can be used to see sound, <coughs> hearing can be used to hear sights, because in front of Hashem, with that re- level of revelation, there's no me. So the power of, of sight normally is very clear on its identity. I'm here to see things, and I only see physical things. And the power of hearing is, well, I'm not as high as you. I hear things, so therefore I can only hear things that are not too far away from me, which are more spiritual. That's normally, each one is very clear on its identity. But when Hashem revealed Himself to the Jewish soul, so our faculties lost their identity completely, completely were nullified to Hashem. So if Hashem says, see this sound... Fine. Okay. We'll do it. I, it's not my thing. Who's me? No, what, what am I? It's just a sham. So the awesome nullification of Bittl completely uh, overrode any personal uh, identity. Like it does with the angels. The angel of fire, the angel of water. I might be fire, but that's me. But in front of a sham, whatever he wants. That's the third explanation. So, Rabbi, what's that? Dalet what Dalet stands for? Dibur v'dibur. I'll call Dibur v'dibur. So, do you remember the three explanations? 
The first one was. But it was Hashem. Hashem. It wasn't the physical. Oh, but the sound we're talking about here is not a physical sound; it's a divine sound. So therefore, the rules don't apply. That's the first one. The second one was. It wasn't in the body. It was out of the body, so it was not. In the source. Enough. In the source, the differentiation, the levels between seeing and hearing, is not so different. So therefore, seeing can hear, and it doesn't matter. And the third one was that because the bittel was so intense, the revelation was so so awesome, so each thing lost its identity and did whatever Hashem wanted. Second and third sound of the same word, no? It's a bit, it's a bit different. One of them is, 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 is talking about that, in, front of the king, that, the that in the source there's not so much difference. The other one is saying that with, with the revelation they became bottled. And this, when it's when it's talking about soul, would it be nefesh abahamis or nefesh No, nefesh Now, let's do the next paragraph on that over over page Rosh Chaf. Now, in Adam, she beetzem and nefesh adain enam mucholakim akoycha zem is a ad shenoim she ain lakoycha ri mail yisera koycha shmiya. Now, even though. As these faculties are within their source in the soul itself, they are not so divided up and differentiated to the point where we can't really say that the power of sight is higher than the power of hearing because they're not differentiated in the first place. But you do have to say that in the soul, all these faculties do exist. They are there. It's not that there's nothing there. It's, there is a power of seeing in the soul and there's a power of hearing in the soul. It's just that in the soul, un- until they've become landed in the body, in the soul itself, they're not so differentiated. They're not so divided up. Because if you say that, no, the soul has no faculties, has no powers, the soul is just soul and nothing. What is the difference between the soul of a human and the soul of an animal? If the soul does not have any faculties itself, so if the soul is just life, that's what the soul is, just life. Like we said, like the plug that you plug into the wall. It's just power, and that's all it is. Then indeed, there would be no difference between the soul of an animal and the soul of a human. The only difference between an animal and a human is not the soul, but the body. That when, that, that when an animal is alive, it's, a, it's got this set of faculties which are in its body. And when a human is alive, it's got a different set of faculties because its body is different. But the soul is just life. And that makes no sense. No. She ikar hefesh ben adam lehem who be dibur she nefesh adam he met nefesh about the baris for nefesh asichus. Because what's the difference between a human and an animal? That an animal does not speak. The human is called the speaking being, which means that we have intelligence and the ability to to communicate a concept. Which an animal does not have. An animal can give out a noise, a, 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 a symbol, a, a signal, but, but an animal cannot convey a concept, an idea. So it must mean we can't say that the animal has not got intelligence because their body doesn't have intelligence. It, it, there's a, a completely different faculty that the human being has. A faculty that simply the animal doesn't have. So to say that the same soul could be in a body or, of, of an animal or, or a, a, a human or wouldn't make a difference makes no sense. Of course, there's, there's faculties that the human soul has that the animal soul does not have. And it's not because of the body, it's because of the soul. The souls must be different. So therefore, even though the soul as it is, out of the body, we say the faculties are not differentiated and defined, but nevertheless, all the faculties are there in the soul. The faculty of intelligence, and hearing, and seeing, and thinking, and walking, and feeling, they're all in the soul. They're just not differentiated, but they're there. This is Nefesh Abahamis? Either one. Would it be? Doesn't matter. Oh. Now we understand why Gilgul is so painful. 
Shikasham is galgal nefesh adam bebehema, because when the soul of a human being is found in an animal, en lo on this bashit, it has nowhere to express itself. Shetzir gufa behema mushlunam gufa adam, because the shape of the animal's body, not just the physical shape of it, but the faculties, the, the abilities of the body of an animal, are totally different to the abilities of the body of a human. The, the, the human being walks upright, which an animal doesn't. Meaning, it doesn't just mean walking upright, it means that our seichel is on top and controls and directs the rest of our, our body, which an animal doesn't. doesn't have that. It's not directed by seichel. Which is why an animal does not walk upright. So, like it says in the Medrash about the original snake in the Garden of Eden, that Hashem says, you know, I created you upright. The snake was, was an upright being at first. Only after he caused the sin was the snake made to crawl on its stomach. So it had hands and feet? Mm-hmm. Meaning, walking upright is is a mila. Is, is that, that's that's an advantage. That's a superiority which the the, 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 the snake had it and lost it. Is that about to other animals? And he spoke. Maybe they had to hide like emus and kangaroos. And they still uh, they still put it to the ground. You know, like they, yeah, but they still walk with their head high. Yeah, that's some emus. I can't make any voice. Nishma becomes Mizkofa Zeo Maila Yisera. Walking upright expresses something of a superiority, that your head is above your heart. So when a human soul, which is supposed to have, is supposed to walk upright, when that human soul is reincarnated in an animal, she is in a state where it cannot express its powers and faculties, which are there in the soul, it's a huge pain. So we said this sort of before, but it's only partly didn't say that the so soul it, has it. The yeah, what, what was our question originally? Yeah. And so how have we answered it? Why would it be painful for the soul to go into an animal? If it doesn't have, only when it's right. in the body. Because originally we understood it, that the faculties are not expressed in the soul, they're only expressed in the body. Mm-hmm. So therefore, if it's in this body or that body, whatever, it will be expressed, will be expressed. Mm-hmm. What's the problem with what's not expressed? It's not there. So no, the answer is no. <coughs> the soul does have those faculties. They totally exist in the soul. They don't exist in a differentiated state, in a defined, separated out state. The soul is an undifferentiated, undefined life force, but within it, is hidden all those faculties. And if those faculties cannot come to the fore, cannot be manifest, that's painful. That is painful. Just because a faculty has not yet become differentiated doesn't mean that its lack of expression is not painful. It is painful because it needs to get out. It's there and it can't get out. So therefore, the human soul has the ability of intelligence, which an animal doesn't have, and when that soul is shoved into an animal's body, there's a, a major identity that cannot be expressed in, in that soul. And that's the pain of guilt. And the whole point of that is that you should learn that when you were in a human body, you didn't use your faculties. You had the opportunity to when you were a human being, and you didn't use your faculties. So now, you're going to learn the lesson by being an animal where you can't use those faculties, and you'll see what a frustration it is. Because, by the way, the human who's in, reincarnated in an animal knows, is aware, that I'm a human soul and I'm in an animal. They know. Is aware? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, souls in the human body, that if some of his faculties aren't working, does that mean that that's a good goal as well? Yeah, like he can use his hand. Well, it doesn't mean it's also painful. Doesn't mean, it's painful. Doesn't mean it's Google. No, it doesn't mean it's, it's a punishment. Because when you're a human being, those faculties that cannot be expressed, you can your soul energy can be expressed elsewhere. You, you can you can find another another avenue, another channel to express it. 
So, so if somebody, let's say, who hasn't got the faculty of hearing, but their sight is sharper, or the other way around, you know. So the faculty has some avenue to, to express itself. Whereas... That's not painful. Yeah, so that's not painful. For the soul, it's not painful. Whereas here, there's no, there's no avenue. There's, no, there's nowhere to put it. So that's, that's why it's painful. So, so this whole discussion... So is it painful for soul if the body is very unwell and it can't express itself at all? It's human, but it's just... Because, the, because what defines a human is not physical power, but, but intellect, so, so for the soul, as, as, long as, as long as the soul can be a soul, can be, be a conscious, aware being... So then it's being expressed. So the fact that the fact that you can't run or move, that, that's that's not what the this human soul defining feature is. If an animal couldn't move, so then what is the animal? If, if it can't run around, that's what an animal is. If a human being can't physically move around, but but is still able to to think, what about to be aware. Can't think? What about so if they can't think, they're not having any pain. They're not aware. They're not aware at all. If there's no awareness, so then then there's no pain. For the soul, no, yeah. But, yeah. But the soul is also not expressing its powers. Mm-hmm. How, how do we know? How, how do we know, know that? that? How do we know it's not expressing its powers? If you're yeah, saying that, saying that, that the the it's, it's something going on in the mind. It doesn't mean intellect as far as studying. It means intellect as far as an awareness. So what? 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 That soul awareness is we don't know. So how's this whole thing? We've now understood this question of Google and why it's painful and the whole relationship between the soul and the body. How? What is this related to our discussion? So continues on the line that starts Shin Aleph Aleph. In the middle. And Mazay you have an Indian Khomer Gufa Adam should see Khomer Mukh and the Kabul Surah Snafish Adam. Now we understand why it's so important, what the Reb Marash explained earlier, that the human body's shape is in such a shape that it should be able to accept the Yud Kevavke of the soul. Shesh Bukh Sershem Yud Shemavaya, that the powers of the soul contained in it the Yud Kevavke, which we explained earlier in the Maimur. Power of Chachma, Bina, Midas, and, and Malchus, and Kabbalah Zohar. Those powers are in the soul. But that's all very good. But if the body does not have the ability to accept and express those powers, so then that will just be frustrating. To have a soul that has Yud Kivavke, but a body that doesn't, is going to be a misfit. It's going to be a, it's going to be a frustration. That's why, it's, that's why the fact that the body is in the shape of Yud Kevavke, what does that mean? It's not just a cute little depiction. It's, it's saying that, no, your body has the tools to express the powers of the soul in it. And that, that was given to us in Matan Torah. That's what it means in the Apostle that says that Hashem, that, that, that the Jewish people are a part of Hashem, of Yehavai Yud Kevavke, meaning that we literally have Yud Kevavke in our soul. And so therefore, that's why it says that we're a part of Havaya specifically, because it's the four letters of Yud Kevavke that we have in our soul. And this happened, the, this was revealed through Matan Torah, where when, we, when the Aseris Zibris was spoken to us, the letters Yud and Hey and Vav and Hey were, in, were imprinted on our soul. We said before that Hashem spoke with you. Hashem Imochem, meaning Hashem spoke to have Yud Kevavke with you, that you should have Yud Kevavke with you as a part of you. So, so now that, that whole story now makes much more sense. The, what the Rebbe Marsh explained at the end of the last part of the Mimer, that our body has the shape of Yud because our soul has these powers. And for the soul to have the power and the body not to be able to express it is not a blessing. So therefore, not just our soul is given Yud but our body as well. So it can be expressed in the body. We, we actually have bodies that are ready to 
fulfill the divine will. So the Rebbe Ramash didn't say this before? He didn't explain why. He, he, explained, he, didn't, why. he, he didn't explain why, what, what, what? What, what's the difference. So you have a, he, he said that the body is a keli for the Yud Kevavke, that he said. Yeah. But now we understand much deeper. If it, if, and if it wouldn't be a keli? So it'd be like being a Gilgal. It'd be, it'd be like being oh. a, a human soul in an animal body. It doesn't fit. It doesn't it can't express itself. Uh-huh. Now that we're in a body that has a head which is in the shape of Yud and fingers which are five, so our body actually is ready to express the Yud Kavavka in our soul. Is the neshama, is the soul like the in anywhere specific or it's just like is it everywhere like right? yeah. sorry yeah everywhere it's not in the it's in and beyond it's rough it's not a sort of yeah thing I know that's right yeah so the last few lines of the paragraph <laughs> but we, what we have to understand is this we just said that through Hashem telling us a Saras Adibris it put Yud Kavavka in our soul in our, in our body it totally transformed us. It was like a being born anew, a totally different reality where Yud Kevodke is now a part of your soul and a part of your body. But what we have to understand is mm-hmm. the commandments that we were given to affect this are very straightforward things. Don't murder. Don't be a false witness. These are very simple things. Through Hashem telling us such simple, straightforward things, we became transformed that Yud Kevavke is now a part of our soul and our body. Because He told us don't steal and don't murder each other. If, if Matan Torah was where Hashem set out expressed some long combination of divine names, which nobody knew what he was talking about, but he said some magical, <laughs> mystical <laughs> statement, and, and suddenly we had Yudke Vavke in our soul and our body. Okay, we can handle that. That, that makes sense. That, that type of revelation, like there was this fearsome revelation of this stuff, we don't know what was going on, and suddenly we were zapped and we had Yudke But for Hashem to say, you know, if somebody else has left some money on the table, you can't take it and say that it's yours. That's stealing. You're not allowed to do that. And now we're Yudke Vavke. Or you might be really angry at someone, but don't kill them. And, and now your kavod is a part of you. Like, this is just very simple human interactions. Okay, why? If it wants to talk to the body, then it needs to talk in the language that the body can relate to. If it would be something. But so even spiritual. so, but even so, let's say it's in language, so it's not gobbledygook. It's it's something you understand. But something a bit profound, at least <laughs> something something that only Hashem could have said that, not something that anyone could come up with. It's got. To, You'd think the revelation is going to be something a bit dramatic. Maybe he's trying to tell Just us don't that steal. Maybe Hashem is trying to tell us that to bring gifts K it has to be yeah. These ah, you get started. Could be, could be that's one answer. But the gam tzorich lavin. Third last line. Another thing we have to understand is lama hay tzorich lis dvarim pshutim keelu kolus of rakim the kolus shayf a chazak ma'ot. And whatever explanation we have for why these aseres adibris inserted Yud Kevavki in, in us, we also have to understand why the accompaniment of Kodos of Rakim, of thunder and lightning and shofar blowing to tell us don't steal. Like, j- just tell us. You know, that's fine. Don't steal, okay? You, you need, the, you need the, the whole background, the whole, the whole <laughs> orchestral, you know, thing. Egypt, you know. They could have told us in the middle of Egypt that the pyramid yeah, yeah. Could, have, could have just sent a message, you know. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't need to be so dramatic. No. And the bigger question is that to do this, Hashem himself had to come down and tell us. Hashem came down, it's emphasized over and over. Hashem came down on Mount Sinai. I've got to tell you something. Don't murder. <laughs> Send a message. Don't, 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 anyone can tell us that. You don't have to... Don't go out of your way. Hashem has to come down and do this. All this needs to be explained. Yes, Hashem, the rest of the mind will be explained. Thank you. Before she makes her